I grabbed at least the very basic agenda and kind of plopped it in there. So I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, getting started, let's uh, do some agenda bashing. So does anyone have anything uh, to add to the agenda that is not currently on there? Well, I sort of, it's much here. I sort of took a freedom to add the basic use case. Uh, so that's there. Feel free to cross it out. There is no time. Uh, I, I think we'll have time. Uh, the agenda seems uh, a little shorter than, than last week. Uh, so I think we should, uh, should be able to get to it. Uh, okay, cool. Also, I, I think Prem should be coming back uh, soon as well. And once Prem comes back, uh, then he'd be a really great person for, for you to uh, uh, get to know since he's doing a lot of the, uh, the use case documents as well. So just, uh, just for your information. I, I know, I've been uh, away. I got distracted for a few months, but I, I've been here before. So uh, I've looked at uh, Prem's doc already a few times and I have uh, lots of questions, but I'm, a, I'm a, a simple guy. So I'm starting with a basic one. Thanks. Cool. Okay, so uh, starting off, uh, for those of you who are going to be in Vancouver on August 28th for the open uh, for the um, um, for the open source summit. So the open source summit runs from Wednesday to Friday, uh, but the Monday and Tuesday before they're running workshops, and on the Tuesday there is a cloud native. Uh, network function seminar, and we highly encourage anyone who's attending the Open Source Summit, if you're able to get to the um, network functions seminar, to uh, to sign up. And so the way that you sign up is when you are registering for the summit, it'll ask you what uh, what additional uh, workshops you'd like to attend and. I believe there's no cost for attending the Cloud Native Network Function Seminar. There, there is a cost for some of the ones on Monday, but uh, the, the Tuesday Cloud Native Network one is uh, should not ha should not have any cost to it, and that's in the afternoon. Who, who's running it? Can I ask? If there is some more detail posted anywhere? Uh, there is information if if you click on the schedule. Yeah. Uh, in the that's that's in the meeting notes. Uh, you, you'll see that it's, uh, you get some of the information on it. Uh, I believe it's ran by uh, two, two people. So one of them is Arpit, who runs the, uh, uh, the uh, Linux Foundation uh, network group. So basically like mm -hmm. their umbrella organization that has like seven projects uh, uh, and he's, He's the person at the top, and also another guy named Dan Cohn, who's the executive director for the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. So, mm -hmm. uh, so very, very good people to get to uh, to get to know, um, and definitely people who uh, have a lot of sway in the Kubernetes and uh, Cloud Native uh, and and uh, networking communities. So. Um, so sorry, I've got uh, another another question because I quickly read uh, what's there. Um, is anybody from uh, from this crowd uh, attending? Uh, anybody, uh, anybody presenting? Yeah, I'll I'll be going. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll definitely be attending. Just to sort of put a fine point on it, that that workshop is not going to be a presenting kind of space. Um, it, it's going to be a seminar, which means mm -hmm. that it'll conversational with a lot of back and forth with the audience. So in some sense, um, you know, to be in the audience is to be part of the, the what is going on there, not just Okay, a, uh, okay. That, that, that's actually what I what I meant. So, you know, uh, be, being active, proactive, uh, loud, occupying our space, whatever. If you are at there, I'm sure uh, NSA will be <laughs> <laughs> uh, But um, so, I think you just implied I'm loud. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, so because the, the topics is, is you know, clearly uh, very interesting and projects are two. So do we expect, apart from this crowd here, do we expect a lot of folks with uh, you know, the CNF dear to their hearts talking about the actual real 
problems and 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 ways they are approaching this the, the, this this problems. I I would expect. I, in, a, in other words, do we believe that it is a worthwhile um, place to be in? I suspect that it'll it'll be a mixed group. So like we're we're not we're not the only group who's uh, participating in it, and. Uh, so the fact that both Arpit and Dan are both uh, driving it, uh, and so for a start, the the I'd be very I'd be very surprised if there were if there was not a large presence from the uh, from the Kubernetes network uh, SIG group, um, and you also have under that under that umbrella, you also have. Uh, uh, the cross cloud CI, you have like ONAP, FIDO, Open Daylight. So I mean, some pretty huge projects that that are represented under under their uh, fold that deal specifically with uh, with networking. Okay. And so so I, I'd expect there to be a, a pretty diverse uh, diverse group there. Yeah, I, I think it's a, I think it's going to be a very worthwhile experience. Frankly, it's actually um, you know quite frankly, it's a big part of the reason I'm going to OSS this year at all. Okay. Okay. Let me check my schedule. Thank you. Um, uh, that's uh, good feedback. Thank you. And here I thought you were going for my talk. <laughs> I, 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 I did not, I would forgotten the fact that you were giving a talk because this has been filed under go for this, this, this seminar. No yeah, offense. No worries. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, so. There was an action item as well that was uh, that was assigned to you at about asking to make a question about uh, sending our inv an invite to SIG networking. Uh, so I, I, I managed to I managed to do a different action item that's later in the agenda. I, I've not actually asked, sent that ask to Tim currently. I should get that done. But I did ask about sort of where we should go in formal structures within Kubernetes, and that's a little further down in the agenda. Okay. Well, let's leave that one on me for next time. The um, yeah, and, and that's uh, that's further down in the agenda, so we'll we'll definitely get to that. Um, okay. So next question is, do we want to cancel next week's meeting since it is the Fourth of July holiday in the United States? So for for reference, the Fourth of July is on the Wednesday. Uh, our meeting is. Uh, is on Friday American time. So uh, what do, does anyone have any opinions towards whether we should cancel or not? Well, this I, I put this on the agenda. This is just something Ed and I discussed the previous week. I just thought I'd put it out there. I, I personally won't be around next Friday, so I won't, I won't be attending the call. the call. It shouldn't happen, but I was just curious if, if a fair number of people weren't around, then you might want to consider it was all. You know, I, I, I think most things are canceling next week, uh, just because of the bizarre placement of the holiday in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, and I also want to be a bit careful not to feel like people are pressured to show up to the meeting uh, just because we're holding one as well. Yes, so. exactly. So, I, I I'll be working next Friday, but for what it's worth. So if there's a meeting, I'll attend it. If there isn't, well, then I won't. Yeah, me, me, me too. Me. But let let give Americans a bit of the slack. They don't have that much of the you know holidays. So <laughs> I, uh, I I'm I'm one of those uh, magic, but <laughs> nevertheless, I will be available next Friday. I, Tom, I think you're proving his point. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Carl. So wait, well, what's a holiday? Yeah, that's right. Fred, <laughs> check, check 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 the Oxford English Dictionary. It's <laughs> Frederick, do you remember those days where everything gets very quiet and you get a lot done? Um, <laughs> oh, six days. Ask, ask Webster guys to talk to Oxford guys to, to you know, fill in the gap in the dictionary. <laughs> okay, so, so you're, ta you're talking about the days when uh, the days when the when the previous jobs when my boss got sick and didn't call meetings. Okay, yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I think uh, I, I I would I personally would be more comfortable I, I personally would be more comfortable uh, canceling it just so that uh, people don't feel forced to to come. Uh, 
who want to, who are going to take long weekends. Uh, so, uh, but what do you, what do you think, Ed? Should we, should we cancel it or should we, should we leave it on? Yeah, I'd be really inclined to cancel it, um, you know, yeah. for, for a variety yeah. of the reasons that are sort of been here. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's call it cancel. The, the only problem that we're going to have with canceling it is that the person who can cancel it is on vacation right now. <laughs> we could put a really big note at the top of the meeting minutes. Yeah, that's what we should do. Yeah, we'll just put a big note with the date and say meeting has been canceled. Yeah, I'll, I'll reach out because Prime is the one who, who owns that calendar event. Um, and so I'll send a message to him. But uh, yeah, I, well, that, that's a good idea. Let's, let's stick it in the agenda as well, just, just in case. And, and we've got 15 people who have heard the news firsthand, so that's pretty good. Yeah, so I mean, if you want to show up, feel free to, and you can have a conversation, but yeah, there, there won't be an official agenda. Um, okay, so uh, this was pretty exciting. So there was some discussion about becoming a Kubernetes working group, um, and Ed has all the details, so I'll, um, I'll yield to him. Yeah, so th there's a standing item where we sort of ask the security guys, hey, um, what do you think is the appropriate formal thing for us to become in the Kubernetes ecosystem? Uh, should we be a SIG networking subproject? Should we be a working group? What should we be? And, and so we, we took this question to the SIG networking meeting yesterday, and, and Tim was pretty forceful that he felt that we should be a, a Kubernetes working group, um, which I'm completely fine with. Um, and he talked me through a little bit of the sort of, of where do we go, what do we do, uh, you know, how do we mesh with how that all, all that stuff is written kind of thing. Um, and so on my to-do list is to sort of get a, a PR going where we could, um, that we could basically submit in order to get that, that wheel rolling. Um, I'll probably end up reaching out to folks on the net, uh, SIG networking, or the, the, the network service mesh mailing list. Uh, just to give you guys a pointer to it so you can comment and uh, we can sort of get it converged a bit. Um, but but that's actually very good news. So it does seem like an appetite for us becoming a formal working group. Yeah, one of one of the questions that's uh, that Ed and I had spoken about really early on was about like what a what is a the best way to engage the the community and uh, being a part of a group like Kubernetes or CNCF or so on, um, we can see that like only only helps to drive people towards looking at the project and contributing. And so, uh, and also the, the more people that we that we get, then will we get more use cases? We better understand the problems, work out where our holes are, and so. Uh, so there's more structure that, that would get put on. We'd have to work in with uh, with their release schedules and uh, and pass information up about uh, what we're doing on a regular basis and try to uh, probably relax this a bit for us because of how new it is, but uh, you know, give them a, a, a roadmap and they ask for up to a year. But uh, where where will we be in a year? Uh, that's, that's a pretty open question at this point. Um, and so, well, so one thing to keep in mind with that, by the way, is there, there's a bunch of stuff they say there that's listed that they're looking for in terms of questions we should ask ourselves. But when you, you look at the actual approved working group proposals, um, you know, for example, they they are much simpler than than at least what I initially imagined from reading the the talk on how to become a working group. So I, I, one thing I do want to be careful about is us making our lives unnecessarily difficult. Um, so I'm drawing a lot of inspiration from other successful working group proposals. So, but yeah, so a little bit of overhead, but but overall, I uh, think, think it should be a good move. So are there any, any questions or concerns or uh, comments? Uh, nothing other than thanks, Ed, for, for chasing that down, and I think it's going to be pretty exciting for the project. I'm hoping so. Uh, it, it does look like a good idea. 
All right, so a uh, question for those of involved. Uh, we need to start adding our images to Docker Hub and to start getting, start getting them uh, automatically built and published. So uh, would anyone like to volunteer to, to be that person? Yeah, I added this comment because I, I was facing some issues. And, hi, this is Pratik, by the way. So uh, I was working on the sidecar thing and for that to get automated, I uh, the it needs to pull the image from somewhere. So right now I'm just using some fake image which is already there in Docker Hub. So it'll be good to have. I saw there was a PR merge for the the init container. So it'll be good to have all those images so that we can directly pull. So that you can pull them. But uh, you know, to use the init image, you don't have to have it on the Docker Hub because it gets built during the CI. So it's stored yeah. in the local Docker storage. You just need to refer to it. That's it. I mean, it's yeah. not as convenient, but it's it's workable solution. Is there a reason that we are publishing the init container to our to our Docker Hub? Like we're pu publishing other things. I don't think we're publishing anything to Docker Hub yet. Uh, maybe I could be wrong about that. Um, I mean, I, yeah, we're not putting any images there, so that's the challenge. So if I have to deploy to my Kubernetes cluster, I have to copy the image to that host first, and then. Yeah, I think deploying to uh, to Docker Hub should be, um, or there's there's a couple of other repositories as well, uh, but I, I think picking one, deploying to it should be um, uh, should be a good thing. And if I recall, there's a there is I I believe there's a legato uh, username that we could yeah. have the option of posting to. Yeah, I do have a repository for us under Legato Network Service Mesh. And you're right, there, there don't appear to be anything, doesn't appear to be anything there yet. But I do actually have that, you know, this is why my brain was saying I thought we were doing that. And it was because um, I, I, I went and got the place to put things, but apparently do the work to actually put things there. Yeah, there's a, so Do Docker Hub will, uh, you can enable a trigger that will read a Docker file and will uh, will build it, and so that's probably the mechanism that we uh, that we should use. Cool. So at this point, I see we have three container images. One is for NSM, another one is for the init container, and the third one is for the webhook mutation server, which uh, which there's a PR. So there are three images we can push at this point. That's awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna stick that on as um, an actual item. Ed, you're, you're probably the only one uh, present that has access to it, so. That, that's certainly within the realm of possibility. Um, yes, that, that, that certainly could be true. Uh, it depends on how much presence of mind I had and when um, in terms of adding other folks. So. Okay, well, my username is the same as my IRC name, so if you want some assistance with that, I can I can do that as well. I mean, independent of assistance or not, I think we should probably get a few more names on it, so. Cool. Um, okay, so uh, there was a request for adding a make file for creating images and uh, and binaries. Yeah, that's so, from my side. So I just wanted to get the opinion if it is fine to add that because there are multiple uh, command directories we have where we can build those binaries and images. Yeah, I, I personally, well, before I give my, my uh, request, does, does anyone have any comments about make files? I, did we, I vaguely recall this a few months ago when we started this, we, I believe we decided not to have a make file, though I cannot recall why. Yeah, I, I, I think it, part of the way it started was that when we started out, um, a make file was just ridiculous amounts of overhead for a very simple thing, right? Um, and then we transitioned to using Docker files to build things. Um, and it made a lot more sense to have the build be Docker oriented, um, where you would basically build a Docker file. Um, yeah. You know, and, and, and so I'm not, you know, I, I'm, I, I, 
effectively we moved a lot of what you would do in make into Docker. Um, and, and so you know, I think part of it is the question of like, how much complexity do we think we need? What would we put in a make file that we don't currently put in the Docker files? And or would a very simple make file make things somewhat easier for some folks? Yeah, we do have a set of script uh, script files. And so you run like scripts and there's a, there's a build and so on that, that can be ran that uh, will, uh, they will initiate it all. One option that we have though is uh, a make file is probably more discoverable. Uh, like pretty much every custom, custom or not every, like every major tool uh, with the exception of, uh, of go, uh, idea based uh, IDEs that's how to properly use a make file. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my tendency is that I, I think I'd be completely comfortable with a very simple convenience make file, something that went and ran the Docker builds or you know ran the scripts directly. But since what Make is really good at, which is managing dependencies, um, you know, Go has largely abrogated the need for it because it's really good at freaking building systems. Um, I would tend to want to keep it as a simple convenience make file. Yeah, so let's. Let's go and add one, uh, and it'll just be a make file that that calls the scripts and uh, that calls the build script, and that's and then let's leave it at that and uh, uh, not not add anything else to it. Uh, and that way, people can do like meta meta x make or uh, colon make and vim or or so on, and just have the tool tool run it automatically as well. I think that's a good idea, Fred Frederick, and also it will it will sort of flush out issues with things being missing in the scripts as well. Having a top-down start and it makes it more accessible. Yeah, and and at this point, adding anything more complex than that, I think, uh, should be rejected. So, just literally. The minimum number of lines we can get away with, two or three lines of of make file. Yeah, that was my initial idea behind this, to use make file to call all the Docker commands so that we don't have to play around with multiple scripts and we can have simple make commands. And once we create the documentation around how to get users started, so that will be an easier way to get in rather than going to different directories and running those scripts. So yeah, make file, I agree, should only be calling the Docker build scripts and nothing else. So it will not be handling the dependencies. That was my initial thought process. Okay, um, so me. Yeah, so go, so go ahead and uh, if, if you wanna take, would you be comfortable taking that on as, a, as an action item? Yeah, sure, I can take. Okay, and uh, who was it that was uh, taking it on? Uh, how do you spell that? C R A T E E K. I can type. Yeah. Is it? Okay, no, great. Yeah, yeah, I can fix it. Yes. Great. Um, okay, so action items are for uh, review. Uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and take off that top one. Uh, so. We've been working on inventing a character for uh, for Ed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, I believe we have a candidate, but uh, before we commit to such a candidate, uh, I want to know if anyone else wanted to to create a character for Ed. <laughs> <laughs> this, this may turn into a puppet show, so. Pretty exciting. Oh, Dude, <laughs> you know me well enough, Frederick, not to tempt me. <laughs> you really know better. <laughs> so when I say that, I, I don't say that in jest. <laughs> Again, I, I, I you know better than to tempt me. So anyways, this, uh, does anyone else want to uh, participate in that? What are the rules of engagement? Come up with some type of a 
so see if I can give a good example. So when we're looking for some type of a mascot or, you know, and uh, the two mascots that, I, that are, or I, so let's speak a little bit about, like uh, when you're thinking of, of mascots, like if you look at the Go mascot or you look at the Linux mascot, like they're, they're things or animals that can, they can do things that can be actionable. Like uh, the Linux one, the artist who's a artist from Texas A&M who submitted it in uh, said that he wanted it to look like a, like a very happy penguin who had just had a large meal of his favorite fish. And so, but if you look at it, it's like, you, you know, there's, it can, it can do things it represents the community. So we want something that represents uh, our community and can do things and is active. And so, but also, you know, friendly, you know, so, so that's yeah, basically carrying, carrying resemblance to it. I don't, I don't know how this, this came about being a character for Ed problem. This is a, this is a mascot for a network service. That's why, that's why it, became a, it, came, it became a character for Ed, uh, and then it turned into a mascot, I think. Right. And the reason why is because you said you wanted to have a character for, for, a, for a book or for the... Oh, for, for like a story like the, the story of Fippy for Kubernetes. Yeah, and then, and then it grew from there. So this action item needs to be renamed to create a mascot. Okay, well, how about we give it one more, one more week and then after that, uh, if nothing comes up and then uh, We'll, we'll go with a with a mascot that that Ed and I can can select. I'll, I'll rephrase I mean, that's that. A, that's a, that's an excellent uh, AI for the um, for the Fourth of July holiday. I think I think so too. So that means two weeks two weeks from now. Is 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 that is that too long, Ed? I don't think that's too long. Um, you know, we can sort of see how it shakes out. Okay. Um, so next act, action item. Uh, so Tom, uh, you were going to look at some uh, some documentation. I remember you asked some questions as well. So how how is that going? Yeah, I, I, it's coming along. I I don't have it done yet. I I had about half the week to work on it at the most, and um, I. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll generate a pull request when I get some uh, MD files uh, together. I just got text files all over the place at the moment and want to make sure I can reproduce everything in my VM, um, you know, in a, in a, in a controlled environment. And, you know, I'll, I'll reach out to you and others when I, uh, if I have some questions, but so far it's just, you know, there's a, there's a lot of very basic startup stuff that seems to be missing in the existing documentation. That's what I started with. But as um, soon as I've got something concrete, I'll, I will um, I'll submit a pull request. Okay, fantastic. And um, just a heads up, a future action item, which is not going to be on on Tom is going to be for someone who uh, has not gone through the network service mesh project uh, in detail to go through the documents and give the uh, give the documents a spin and give feedback as to it, it, well I, I'm doing that I have some uh, changes to the documents too that as I found mistakes not mistakes but th things that have changed I guess since the document was written in inconsistencies with file names and things like that, that I checked that I fixed in my local versions as I went along. So cool. I thought that was part, that might be part of the effort, but yeah, absolutely. Everybody should look at them and then we'll merge all the changes. So, okay. So action item for uh, Taylor to document CNCF, uh, CNF. Um, I'll let you speak Taylor. Hey, uh, can y'all hear me? Yes. 
Okay. I started working on, I guess, the, the document. What I need to do is move it over into the wiki, create a wiki page. I think that was the next part. I pulled together some notes on how um, the CrossPod CI portion could help um, with some of the testing on Kubernetes clusters and then the actual CNF project, which is the comparison project. Probably two pages for this. Uh, a question, if I could interfere. Are, are we uh, yeah. going to maintain some wiki pages? I, I just sort of was under the assumption that everything was going to be marked down. Maybe I'm confusing that with discussions in other groups, but uh, just a question. I mean, uh, that's what I was going to assume with my stuff, is I was going to put it in, my, in additional markdown file as well as some changes in the existing markdown files. I don't know. So there is, a, there is a wiki. Thank. Yeah, there, there is a wiki and it's made of markdown files. So you're good. Fantastic. Nobody likes to edit wikis. But everyone has at least made their <laughs> markdown. So yeah. on the GitHub wiki, um, is that where y'all would like me to put the uh, CNS items? Yeah, that'd be uh, that'd be a fantastic place to to put them, and uh, you should have the you should have access to edit them. So if you have any trouble, um, let me know. Sounds good. Okay, so um, Pratik, uh, I'll let you uh, speak. So I created the wiki document uh, documenting all the, the components we need to build for the, adding the sidecar uh, admission into the pod creation. And I also created a PR page on that, which is a work in progress. I still have to add some more code around that. So yeah, feel free to take a look. I'm not sure if in wiki it allows to add comments. So we should have a way where we can submit a document and people can comment on it. Yeah, that's that's a good point. We'll have to take a look to see how GitHub um, handles those issues. Yes, I created, I can paste a link here. So here's the, the link for the wiki document I created, adding sidecar containers. I don't see an option at least for me to add any notes. It gives me an option to edit, but can't add comments. Maybe what I can do is I can add another doc, this document to a Google doc and share around to get some comments. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. And then we can transcribe it. Uh, what about uh, creating a doc folder in the repo and basically do a PR uh, with the, with the, whatever the document you have for in that uh, doc, uh, doc folder and then we can actually comment and uh, then when it's finalized, it can get merged into that doc. Yeah, that's also a good idea. We can do that. Whatever folks agree. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea as well. Uh, my my hope was that GitHub uh, wikis would have some of the GitHub um, standard features in it because at the end of the day, GitHub wiki is just a Git repo. So it's um the, the fact that it seems to be missing these features is uh, highly unfortunate. Yeah, I'll take a look around. If it doesn't let me add comments, and then I'll create a docs. A dog documented dogs. Uh, I'll go along with whatever you want to do if to. Okay. 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 Um, yeah, and the only the only downside on, well, one of the downsides on uh, adding it into the docs is that means that it's the hurdle to add to it is uh, is a bit higher, but um, that. 
that that might that might be okay if, if if it enables us to have reviews. So we'll have to think about think about that a little for a little bit. Uh, we'll add an action item to to return to to that to work out where we should uh, where we should place these documents in the long run. So the wiki is a branch on the repo, so it may allow pull requests. I thought it was an entirely new wiki, or sorry, an entirely new uh, GitHub repo, because the URL is different. Like you, uh, to download the wiki, you do git clone github.com slash org slash project dash wiki dot git. So it's, uh, as a, it has a different URL. Uh, that's new to me. It used to just be a branch on whatever the repo, and you'd go to that branch and any changes you push up, in that branch would show up for the wiki. Yeah. If so it's a completely different repo, then that may even be easier to do pull requests. A doc folder is totally fine, though, if we just want to do markdown files. It doesn't have to be on the wiki. I, I like the docs folder and markdown files personally, but um, but I think at one point Frederick had said that we could we, we, we could convert the wiki eventually to, to markdown files in a docs repo. So. Yeah. Well, it, it isn't the markdown a good starting point, though? I don't know. I just said well, what still, I assumed to begin with. The, the content is, 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 not, is not really the, the problem itself. So in, in both scenarios, it'll be the same content. It's just a matter of, of where, where should the documentation live? Like, should it be part of the, uh, part of the main repo itself? And part of the idea was that there's some information that is, that it doesn't really matter what version it is you're using. Oh yeah. Uh, the information is is relevant, um, but there's there's nothing wrong with with saying if you want to see that information, look at the the latest, uh, the latest release branch or master branch as well. Like that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do as well. Yeah, it's a good point about versions. So. Okay, well, I'll, I'll add an action item to, on, onto me to, to look up to see what uh, what remedies we have for this, and we'll we'll definitely come back to that. Yeah, in the other projects, I have seen people follow this approach. They they add it to the docs, and then once they finalize, people have resolved all the comments. Then they move things to the, over to the wiki. Uh, yeah, Kubernetes uses the same, that they have a community repo where all the proposals are, are stored and then there's a discussion happening over there. Yeah. So um, it's pretty much common. All right. I mean, there, there, there are lots of good ways to solve this, frankly. Um, so let, let's just sort of pick the simplest one and go. Yeah. So I want to make sure that we get to the uh, use case as well that, um, that was listed be, uh, below. So. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, and move on. So I'll, I'll take a look at that, and then we'll 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 revisit. Uh, so let's. Um, we had an action item as well for people to look at getting involved with the pod to NSM API. Uh, I won't discuss that in detail at this particular point, uh, other than to say that we have something that's been merged, uh, and. That is, it's what is there is not set in concrete. So, uh, based on the use cases, uh, you know, we're we're happy to change things to to accommodate. So, um, but it, it's it's there for people to to take a look at. Um, okay, for issues that have occurred in the past uh, or that have been closed in the last week. Uh, We've had, we've actually had a relatively busy, not from the issue side, but from the pull request side, we've had a pretty busy uh, uh, period of time. So we've added a new uh, CRD handler interface. Uh, the We also added an object store so that the CRD objects have a place to actually stay and live. Uh, and there's been improvements uh, on on our logging, so we're we're moving towards. At this point, we're moving towards Logris, and uh, having it produce uh, uh, 
uh, I believe the, the plan is to have it produce JSON uh, log files that can be ingested by uh, um, through Fluentd to to a stack of uh, of your choice. Um, uh, sorry, I have a question about the logger. Sorry in, to interrupt you. Sure. Uh, I mean, maybe it's uh, just lack of my knowledge, but I mean, w one of the reasons why I never use loggers is because I never managed to get in the uh, message which it generates uh, the line number from the source code. Like when you debug. And uh, it's 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 less convenient with the uh, G log when you get a message with the name of the source file and the uh, line number where that uh, message was generated. Sure, I was curious. Of that Sergey, that can absolutely be done with Logris, and in fact, it can be done in a way that's more convenient because you could essentially have a JavaScript attribute like lock or source or whatever you choose to call it. Um, that contains that value. So when you're dealing with something that is, you know, you know, as Frederick was saying, JavaScript aware, uh, JavaScript aware log uh, digesters of various sorts, um, they you can pull that out more easily. So you can definitely do that. Um, there, there, you know, I have seen it do it myself, and we definitely want to continue doing that totally. Cool. If you could, if you could uh, provide an example, that would be awesome because it's uh, a bit painful um, without, without it. This. Yeah, no, no. What I'd be wanting to do is just push something that makes it trivially easy to do, right? Because what you really want is you want it to be such that every time someone is logging, that information is being logged without them having to actually do something to cause it to happen. Yep. So, uh, also. Um, there have been uh, there's been work on getting uh, plugins to become uh, uh, idempotent. So basically, when you call init or close uh, multiple times, so this is for plugins that depend on other plugins, that uh, things don't uh, blow up on you. So uh, trying to make dependent uh, plugin dependency an important step in making plugin dependency management uh, easy to easy to handle. Uh, We've been adding, we, we added the init container, uh, which uh, we discussed earlier uh, earlier as well. Uh, we are uh, we are also adding uh, config so config map uh, parsing code. So basically, config map is a configuration that's stored within Kubernetes, and then that information's uh, pushed into the container, and we're parsing parsing that. Uh, and so on the agenda for the next week as well, uh, depends on, so we had Kubernetes 1.11 that was recently released. So we've also are getting things set up for that migration. So when client go cuts a, cuts a branch, then we're also going to be moving the project to, to 1.11. So just a heads up. Uh, and want to make sure we get to the to the use case. So I'll uh, apologize if I get your name wrong, guys. Uh, Masiak. Yes, try again. Okay, so <laughs> joking, joking, joking. Masiak is fine. It's cool. not, not an anglophonic name, and it's also not a francophonic name. It's a Polish name. So I'll uh, I'll spell it phonetically next time. Cool. Thank well, you, you have the floor. Okay, uh, I only have like four slides and, um, and they posted at the link. So uh, I don't know, can I, can I share a screen so you can see my mouse? Sure. Okay. All right, let's see if it works. Okay, you should be able to see the online version of the slides. Okay, so... Um, I think I, I've been uh, on one of uh, of the calls here a while back, uh, and I got distracted, and I'm back, and hopefully I won't get distracted again. Um, but I looked at um, the slides uh, Ed, that uh, I think you put together, or or, or whoever, um, specifically the um, the distributed CNFs, distributed bridge case, and as I'm a bit allergic to L2, I thought, why don't I look at IP? I also looked at the use cases document, but I, I realized that I'm a bit behind. So I'm gonna play a catch up. And if what this following four slides 
if they are basically me, it means that I'm barking up the wrong tree, just, just feel free to shut me down at any uh, time. Um, I have used uh, the, 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 the slides referred to, and um, I just uh, you know, replaced L2 semantics with IPv6 and IPv4, and I called it uh, virtual routing and uh, forwarding VRF. Not a, dis not a distributed router, um, not a virtual router, uh, but um, I just, you know, um, I, I use that name. Uh, so if you are familiar with the slides that I re referred to uh, earlier, um, you should be the distributed bridge, uh, then your brains uh, must be now also very familiar with the iconography used on those slides. So thank you, Ed. And um, the, the problem is very simple. Uh, uh, you know, similar to the distributed bridge, it's just that the pods don't want to connect uh, over the, uh, the uh, uh, L2 uh, bridge network, so distributed bridge networks or emulated LANs, but they like to, connect it, uh, to, to get connected over um, distributed verbs. And um, I'm not calling it a VPN because uh, the, the routing plane, the control plane in the network control plane routing is not part of this uh, uh, use case. Uh, it's actually orthogonal to it. Um, uh, it's it's really connectivity of the uh, the pods to the uh, to the uh, IP forwarding instances, whether they are public or private, doesn't really matter. Uh, they are clearly you know logically uh, isolated, and um, and the way the um, the this distributed thing is uh, implemented is also you know using some sort of um, uh, IP tunneling, and um, like in the, in the case of the distributed bridge, um, VXLAN was referred to and, and other tunneling technologies here, uh, you know, a VXLAN GPE, which is a, a new draft that is going through the ITF, um, uh, basically adding the, uh, the, the protocol field uh, in the VXLAN header, and it's referred to as VXLAN GPE, or GRE, or some other, you know, IP over IP, or IP over L2, or MPLS um, encapsulation. Make sense so far? Okay, uh, now here is where I, I may have got things uh, wrong. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. Was there a question? No, uh, it, it makes sense to me. Good, okay. Uh, so um, looking at the, at the you know, definitions, um, network service, uh, it's, uh, you know, the, uh, the name is VRF0, um, selector app is VRF0 and the pot the, uh, the pod instance that is actually uh, providing uh, the service on a specific node um, uh, is, uh, is basically uh, uh, labeled with the app VRF0 and, uh, and it carries the name of VRF0 pod. Uh, in terms of the channels, I have put here the, uh, the name of the channel, uh, VRF IP6, uh, as this specific, in this specific case, the distributed verb is serving IP6, um, IPv6 uh, payloads, and um, uh, but uh, you know IPv4 is another option. Or if the dual stack is supported, then IPv4 and uh, plus IPv6. And uh, in terms of the uh, the NSM uh, way, uh, again, thanks, Ed. Um, it was a bit of the replace all here. Um, the only difference from the um, from the distributed bridge is that the pod that is providing uh, the, the service uh, here is basically um, uh, providing VRF zero uh, uh, a service, not a, not a, a bridge zero service. Uh, everything else stays the same. And um, in terms of the uh, a distributed implementation, um, we can have, uh, one can have those VRF zero pods living on nodes and then they, you know, uh, connect by magic. Um, and one, you know, if, from the data plane perspective, it could be VXLAN GPE tunnels between each other in terms of, you know, the address, uh, addressing, um, uh, IP addressing management and uh, IP address provision and um, uh, into the, uh, the, the, the pods that are requesting the service, as well as the routing part is, is orthogonal and out of scope uh, for, for NSM. Cool. So, so will this work? Uh, it should work. I mean, 
it, it, should, it should work just fine. Obviously, it's up to whoever is deploying the Vero zero pods to figure out how they want to get routes and things like that. Um, you know, just like it's up to um, whoever would deploy a Vero zero pod, how they want to get, you know, what they want to do about things like ARP and, and broadcasts and bridge tables. Um, right. Yeah, it should work just fine. Okay. Very good. It sounds like uh, it's building a sort of a namespace support, which is uh, for the ports. So you can have a multiple namespace, uh, kind of. It's uh, providing a distributed DRF service. So um, uh, namespace uh, from the, you know, the IP namespace perspective, sort of distributed, yes. So one of the things I've struggled with in some of these is, who supplies IP address? Do we use the do we do we, do we reuse IP address from Kubernetes in the pod, or do we create a new IPAM networker namespace? So I, I've actually been thinking about it this way, right? And and this may not be the only way to handle it, but there's a ton of use cases where this is the thing that makes the most sense, right? And the way I've been thinking about it is this: if when a pod goes to connect to a network service endpoint, right, which may also be a pod. Um, the, for example, a pod were to connect to the VRF zero pod, um, then it should get its IP address and possibly some routing information should come back from the VRF zero pod as part of setting up that connection because network service mesh doesn't have any idea what the right IP number is or what prefixes should be sent to VRF zero. But the VRF zero pod has a very good notion of that, right? It, yeah. it, has, it has a very good idea of, of how VRF zero is handling IPAM and a very good idea of how, of, of what prefixes would be yeah. valid prefixes in VRF zero. Yeah, so, so yeah, I, I fully agree. And in fact, uh, for the specific case, say with IPv6, uh, basically VRF zero port will emit an array um, uh, to, to the connected pods and, um, and uh, and then uh, use the, uh, uh, the 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 RA based uh, address allocation uh, to uh, to allocate addresses. So if 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 that's okay with uh, with the group here, I'm very happy to dive a, dip, uh, a bit uh, deeper. I'll try to avoid DHCP uh, for now at least, and uh, we'll look on to what degree we can use an existing uh, you know well known and standard IPv6 mechanics to handle this specific problem. So we're saying that this would be completely orthogonal to the IP address space in Kubernetes. Um, unless there is something going on in the VRF zero pod that makes it non-orthogonal. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's where I'm, I, that's where I kind of sometimes struggle is how does the interaction of Kubernetes happen? We're, we're, creating, a, we're creating an overlay of pods, which is good and, mm -hmm. and then we are, we are, we are similarly to the uh, L2 distributed bridge, we are creating here an, uh, an overlay L3 network. Yeah, yeah, oh, I, I, I almost, agree. It's almost like a you know, distributed VRF, a distributed VPN. Uh, it's, it's nothing to do with the Kubernetes um, network per se. It, it, it's almost like a private connect connectivity over you know, some IP. Yes, oh, I, 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 I... I see. I, I see the, the case, but I'm just trying to think of how oh, Kubernetes would will have any interaction. Should it have any interaction? And at some point, traffic has to go from. I would assume wants to go from Kubernetes to this distributed overlay, mm -hmm. perhaps or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ah, so, so yeah think... Very good. Very good. I think that's actually the uh, the case where we would need to. Uh, to, uh, I would, to address if external connectivity is required. Yeah, so I, I would say there, there's, a, there's the simple case, there's the easy case in my mind. There may be other cases, right? I don't think of everything. But the, the simple case in my mind, I think what you're getting at is, where do we get the IP that's used for the tunnel here, right? Where do we get the tunnel at IP? Um, oh, the tu tunnel address space, I think. Yeah. So it, it, but, but the tunnel address space, are you talking about the tunnel address space for the outer header or the inner header? Outer header. Outer yeah. header that's would need to be. That's what I thought you were talking about. But yeah. So the tunnel address space for the outer header. There's there are two things that are running through my mind. One is um, you could essentially get it from the normal Kubernetes networking uh, space for the outer header. Um, that's one possibility. 
Um, the other possibility that occurred to me. So then, part of two two addresses from Kubernetes, or do we, do we use a part uh, IP address of uh, Kubernetes? Not necessarily. It's going to vary somewhat depending on the data plane, right? Because keep in mind, the thing that has to terminate the tunnel is going to be the data plane. Yeah. It's just over an interface. So, um, you know, effectively, to a certain extent, it gets delegated to how the data plane is dealing with it. Um, and and so. In the mechanical sense, I would expect, for example, if you are setting up Kubernetes networking and you have a kidder and you have a data plane, you might, might want to set aside some number of those, you know, some address for tunneling. And that's one possibility. The other thing that I think is interesting because it's semantically meaningful is you could imagine a situation where you need to be tunneling via a network service, right? So for example, imagine that I have a radio network, right? I have physical NICs connected to the radio network. And the network service I'm trying to reach is actually only reachable via the radio network network service, right? So that's a little more complicated scenario. I haven't thought it all the way through, but um, I am aware of it. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. um, but the way I think of this, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong here, is that this, this uh, VRF is really as magic explained is really agnostic to what the tunneling mechanism is. And the way I thought of it is that the tunneling mechanism is, or the tunneling underlay, is actually another negotiation with the network service manager and another provided function that will set up that tunneling network. And that, in turn, will we'll know about the IP. IP. Yeah, there, there, there are a bunch that, of uh, make, there, there are a bunch of different interesting options there, and I think they will vary somewhat depending on the data plane that you're dealing with. Um, so, you know, it, it, I think it will vary somewhat depending on the data plane you're dealing with, because different data planes will potentially want to hold, handle it differently. Um, so just, so, so just uh, to add, from, 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 from that I gather, sorry, um, that this problem has not been addressed yet for this distributed bridge thing, correct? No, the, the, the outer header IP for tunnels has not been explicitly addressed yet. Right? Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so just, uh, just a heads up, we're over the, uh, the scheduled meeting time, so we can still have discussions afterwards, but um, just need to close up the, uh, the meeting. So again, just, uh, just to remind people, no meeting next week. The next meeting will be on July 13th. And uh, thank you everyone for, for attending. Well, thanks. Oh. Yep. Thanks, bye, everybody. Well, so, so I have a few more minutes. I don't know if anybody else uh, wants to keep discussing this thing because um, I would like to actually explore this verb case a bit further and if the pattern also applies to to, to the distributed bridge um, for the outer uh, thing. Um, I think I think Ed may have disappeared. Um, uh, Ed I, has disappeared. Yeah, okay, we can do it over email. No problem. Did, I mean, did, I, 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 I'm I'm still here. Um, did what I say make any sense? It, yes, it does. Tom. Yes, it does. Uh, but yeah, the, yeah. Um, the 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 I think the question comes down to uh, IP address um, allocation <clears throat> for the outer. Uh, for the outer, uh, for the underlay, uh, whatever, whatever the tunnel, and that needs to be for sure, for sure, coordinated with uh, with Kubernetes, um, because it's a Kubernetes cluster that we're running in, that this thing is running in. And I, I thought I'm I was not sure that this problem has been already addressed, but I'm not sure okay. that's the case because where this is a network service match. And the, 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 Kubernetes, the way we started talking about this stuff months ago, and maybe I'm uh, off, off base, is that the Kubernetes would, at least in one way of thinking about it, be responsible for uh, an IP address space and what we might think of as analogous to the management plane and more conventional networks. And that the, the network service mesh will be will be responsible for orchestrating the elements of the of the, of the data plane which will pro perhaps be based on a on a high speed um a higher speed uh uh a data plane 
and routing elements that are outside of the Kubernetes network. That And this would connect the pods. The pods would be able to talk to each other. And some of the, the gRPCs, if they're remote, might go over the Kubernetes network. I know here they're saying Unix sockets, but the actual data plane traffic will not be part of the Kubernetes network. That's one way of thinking of it. And I realized that in the network working group, there's a lot of people working on multiple address spaces and multis and various other things that look at the world a different way. But I, th I think um, Tom, I thought those were yeah. first principles, I thought. There's, I think there's multiple cases here though, because I think you can have the, the ships in a night overlay case where there's two address spaces and to your case where the management network is Kubernetes and then there's our, our uh, VXLAN overlay that's completely isolated. And, and for some use cases that may work. The other case is where you need to bridge from the network service mesh into Kubernetes, some node. So then there has to be some way of at that point. Yeah, um, then there would have to be a bridge node. I would assume that would or be something, able to or something. Be and then there's the case where you actually want to have an overlay network, but use Kubernetes uh, Kubernetes address space. And I think a lot of this is going to depend on what features each of those things want from Kubernetes, and what visibility and control Kubernetes has into the infrastructure. Yeah, from the uh, network side, I think the only strong requirement that I can think of at this particular point is um, Kubernetes, when you spin up a cluster, has two IP ranges. One of them is the pod uh, the pod IP range, and the second one is the um, service uh, IP range. IP range yeah. And so as long as, there's, as long as there's no collision along those two ranges, uh, if you're using an IP network in your network service mesh, um, it can be and can and most likely it depends on ultimately depends on the SDN that you're that you're using, but it should be seen as an independent um, as an independent construct from from the Kubernetes based uh, uh, systems. Yes. Uh, the, the implementation could create tunnels through uh, through through a Kubernetes IP uh, network like that that is definitely a, a possible implementation um, but uh, it's, it's definitely not a definitely not a requirement and is not is not the typical model that that I think of when when I'm talking about network service meshes. So, 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 so Frederick, to comment on your um, service IP range and pod IP range. Pod IP range is uh, all, it never actually makes it um, to the wire outside, correct? Whereas service IP range is actually reachable from uh, outside and it lives on a wire, physical wire outside of the physical compute node, correct? That's the typical implementation, but it's yeah. not it's not actually mandated by Kubernetes. So yeah. uh, Kubernetes just has three basic rules. It could be flat, yeah, yeah and, and accessible. Yeah, exactly. I so, mean, the service range, I mean, it could be um, internal yeah. addresses and you have to do an extra step to expose them, you know, either to kind of marry them with the proxy or some, some NAT device or something like that. Would it be useful to consider if we become a working group to ask for a network service mesh address space? I, I, it's quite, it's quite but, long way in the future, but it, it's just... yeah. Uh, but I, I, you know, so so tell me if I'm if I'm completely wrong here. Um, whether it is uh, you know mandated or not, if it is a de facto best practice uh, or de facto standard that the service IP that the pod IP range never makes it on out onto the wire. Um, and uh, and the service IP range um, m in most cases is on the wire, whether it is a publicly reachable wire or not, it is living on the physical wire. Then the uh, the the outer address space, uh, sorry, the the address space used for the um, for the underlay uh, in this verf uh, case it must be actually coming from the service IP range. 
Um, that's... And, and if so, and if so, then the the John's point about you know whether NSM needs a separate service NSM IP range or not, you know that's a, that's a, that's the a next question. But but the first one is what I just said. Yeah. So so the way the way that it's that it's set up is that when you do a when you want to set up a new connection, so the new connection would go over a Unix socket to the network uh, service mesh. So it it doesn't it doesn't ever uh, kind of, it doesn't connect to a traditional Kubernetes service in, in that sense. The network service mesh themselves may end up communicating over a service to another network service mesh in order to negotiate a tunnel. Uh, but that's and and you're right, and that's where they they that you worry about the IP addresses for that tunnel. That's, yeah, those, a, that's a negotiation between the NSMs. Yeah, when the NSMs right? are communicating, they're they're using standard Kubernetes primitives. So they're basically talking over the pod uh, over the pod network to right. the other to the other NSM, um, and both of those NSMs have to then negotiate with each other um, the capabilities and establish on both sides the uh, the tunnel. And if you're working within an IP range, uh, like if you're working with an IP tunnel as an example from your from one pod to another pod, then those 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 IP addresses do become important, but uh, primarily just so that you don't accidentally create like if you're using the standard 10, 16 range, you don't want to create a 10, 16. Uh, uh, you don't want to create a, an IP address within that 1016 range. But that being said, uh, it, like it is, you know, even if you were to spin up a pod and say no networking, and then you were to uh, uh, then drop in connections, then you could stick something in, 10, in the 1016 range. So, I mean, so there, there is, there, there are ways to, to make that happen, but, um, yeah, in, in general, it's the the idea is primarily to keep them keep them as separate as possible, and okay. so we, we may we may need to add in some type of of configuration just to say avoid these um, like you pre prefer these ranges or prefer these, um, mm -hmm. but uh, that would probably that would probably be within one of the uh, uh, plugin configs. When, when it's being set. So I don't think, uh, we, we probably don't at this point need to ask for, for a default range. We can probably just pick a default range and uh, to, to start with, uh, because that is, it's, it'd be an implementation detail of the, of the plugin itself. And a, a different plugin that implements a different IP range could set it at. The more, the more important part is that if it's important, uh, if you're doing IP tunneling and it's an important feature, the most important part is that we we have a way to to configure that, and that's one of the things that we're working on is to make uh, is to make the plugins configurable so you can add in whatever whatever needs to whatever it needs to know. And so, then, so is this is the, is is this the scenario that you are that's already you know a work in progress? So for node one or for VRF zero port on node one to be able to establish a tunnel to the VRF0 on port on node 2, because they will have to communicate via NSM, yes? So right and now that, we're- that, that, that involves IP addresses, that involves actually, you know, setting up the tunnel. So the, the part that I mentioned is like, we're, we're, still, we're still building up the initial, I guess you would say infrastructure platform for such a thing mm -hmm. to be built on. So we're not working on, uh, actively on that specific plugin at this point, but uh, we one of the primitives that it will definitely need is uh, a way to set a configuration for that plugin to basically tell it to. Uh, there's also another thing as well. Uh, the NSM itself doesn't really care about what IP addresses you you use. So one one thing that we've spoken about is uh, letting the connections themselves negotiate a um, uh, an address. And so when you request a uh, a tunnel, or when you request a, a service, 
if it requires an IP address, uh, it, the it's it's possible that the service that's providing that functionality may have the most context and could provide an IP um, for for downstream to to use. And so that's that's one model that we're also that we're also looking at as well. Is so and that's in that in that in that essence, one possible pattern would be to have the service be given a set of IP ranges, and then when the clients connect in, the service could then hand out IP addresses as it sees fit in order to exactly. So manage if the connections. if the service's job is to provide a tunnel, then that service has to know about what IP addresses are available that it negotiates with another service. That's the way I think of it. It's all like a network of services, each of which supplies a different layer. Okay, so this guy, right? so this guy should on? actually know. That's what you're saying. No, I think this guy doesn't know. I think the guy, the network service mesh that that he's talking to says, oh, he needs a tunnel. And then he negotiates the details of what that uh, of, of what that tunnel is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. No? All right. Uh, Frederick, is this described kind of anywhere? Because they said that you know this is being built, so this is currently in the in the GitHub uh, code. But are the options um, followed anywhere uh, that I can I can read up on, or is that well? I'll I'll try to be I'll try to be accurate as possible. So right now, there's no tunnels that are being built yet because we're we're still building on building out the primitives for plugins. Um, so right now, what we're doing is we're building a where we're building the mechanism that will allow you to build a plugin. So that okay. includes logging infrastructure, uh, how do you manage, how do you add and manage configurations, uh, object storage for, uh, for those plugins. Uh, so we're, we're trying to, so we're, we're, Building out, like, what does it even mean to be a plugin at this particular point? Okay. Then, okay. All right. So, uh, Ali in front. Okay. Yeah. So once once we get through through that, then one of the questions then becomes, how do we build a uh, a layer a layer three uh, tunnel? How do we build a layer two tunnel? Uh, what should those what should those look like? And one of the things that we're that we're doing is we're trying to build the plugins in such a way that if you if you need to, the decision should come from whichever entity has the most context in this space. And interestingly enough, despite the fact that network service mesh is organizing the negotiation of these plugins, that does not necessarily mean that network service mesh itself has the best context. So it's possible that the service that is that is being exposed may have more context about the problem and likely will have more context about the problem than than network service mesh itself does that make sense yes yep. Yep. and so if that's the scenario if that's the case then that decision should be handed to that service and that service could work out okay i need to hand out this particular ip address or i need to set these parameters or or so on and set the set the right Basically, in the initialization of that connection, that it would pass that information back to the network service mesh and say, "Yes, I, I am accepting this connection with these parameter requests," and the other side accepts as well. And so now you have a successful negotiation, and then you build up the tunnels. And so, from so that that's the current that's the current model that we're that we're looking at is is to allow the service to provide that information and the service could say use use this ip address and so then where would you program this ip address uh, or the range of ip addresses it could use it would be at the um, it would be at the plugin in that in that area and another interesting thing as well is that all of this stuff is uh is technically point to point, uh, and so depending on the tunnel, if, if the tunnel itself is transient and doesn't need to ever be seen, then it's possible that uh, that even if uh, multiple systems end up reusing the same IP address uh, during during the during the tunnels, uh, it's possible that there'll be no adverse effect depending on how 
on how they get handed out and and how the negotiation works. So it just as an interesting side effect. But uh, yeah, in in general, like we we the entity that has the most information as to whether this in should be the one that uh, that that hands it out. Well, it sounds like a good good area for documentation because we are all unsure. You, you mean you mean from the concept perspective? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and this is um, this is something that we're you know we're that we're we've been discussing patterns and trying to work out like yeah. which what direction that we should head. And this is one. It's not the only pattern, uh, but it's it's a pattern that that we think. Would be good to to go towards. Uh, it is possible. It is possible that someone could implement a plugin that um, where network service mesh actually does hold that information, and instead of having the service handle the configuration, the network service mesh plugin itself could could deal with it. So it is it is possible to. What's well, I mean? We should we should lay out the possibilities, and I think you know with Trams help trying to match them to use cases because there is a lot of possibilities here but yeah it's, and it's fairly critical we get this right because without it nothing works i com completely agree and and one of the things about it is that this is the system is flexible enough that if like we we want to provide good patterns and for people to follow those patterns uh, and provide good templates for people to follow but it is flexible enough that if you want to break out of the box, it doesn't stop you from breaking out of the box, but it should make common use cases very simple, very easy to follow. Yes. So that's that's sort of the way that we're looking at it. So one, one of the things we want to be, be careful with is if you actually do have a need for something that's that's not in a common pattern, uh, we, we, we don't want to say uh, no. So we want to be able to say, you can try. <laughs> yeah, very good. All right, I think that clarifies a lot. So uh, cool. let, me, let me think this uh, through. And uh, if, uh, if I have uh, some uh, thoughts on, uh, on that from the specific use case uh, perspective and network mechanics, I'll, uh, I'll provide the next meeting. Thank you. Cool, yeah, and if you have any, if you have any concerns that pop up, you know, let us let us know. And um, one easy way to get a hold of us uh, re with relative ease is um, on IRC. If you hop onto the Network Service Mesh channel, and yeah, sure, sure, I'm there. I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. So, uh, but I'm going to approach it not from orchestration perspective, um, but uh, from networking perspective. So I would like to actually leverage uh, all the hooks we have in the uh, networking specs and functionality that uh, that, that should be there as part of the IP stack in the context of this this with the VRF, V4 and V6, uh, to see to what degree this could be eased. And um, anyway, let me think about that. Thanks. Cool. Well, th yeah, thanks. And uh, definitely looking forward to hearing your, your feedback. Okay. So. All right. Thanks very much. And uh, enjoy your 4th of July break. Ciao. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Take care. See you. Thanks.